Hayden Fort. Yes, I designed that. I'm rather proud of it. I was just 22 when we started the building back in 1862. Lieutenant John Charles Arda. Now look at me. Major General. But you're probably wondering why you needed such a large fortification. Well, the simple fact is that if you have an important harbour, you have to be able to defend it. The Romans knew this. They built a fort here when they invaded the country. And since then, we've had to deal with a series of invasion scares. The first gun was sent to New Haven in 1548 after the French raided Seaford. That's just round the bay. And not long afterwards... The Spanish are coming! The Spanish are coming! As a consequence of the Spanish Armada, the first gun battery was installed. Battery. That's a set of guns, you know? Fortunately, the Navy saw off the Armada, and there was no invasion threat for quite a long time after. But the problem with the English is that we tend to neglect our defences until an aggressor is practically on the doorstep. Now look at this. 1696. The recent survey concludes that it is not worthwhile reinstating the defences at New Haven. Not worthwhile. Britain is at war with France, Russia and Austria. Batteries must be built along the Kent and Sussex coasts. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Right. New batteries to be constructed on eight sites. Well yeah, done, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. The decision was made three years after the start of the war. The new permanent battery with five 12 pounder guns was completed in 1760. There was no invasion, but a few months later, the guns saw action. <laughs> The smuggling ship was sighted. Fired three shots at a privateer. Missed. All was quiet for some 19 years. Then... France and Spain declared war on Britain. France and Spain. Ah, a great number of wooden carriages have rotted. Gun barrels are on the ground. The ammunition is scaled with rust. Powder, suspect. Dear. Now what? The Emperor Napoleon is mustering a mighty invasion fleet just over the channel. A thousand French ships! That's all. A thousand infantry are needed to defend this area. The old batteries should be kept up. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The number of men in the batteries is not sufficient. Oh, not at all, certainly. No. And just 12 years after the first invasion threat by Napoleon, Eight 24-pounder guns at New Haven, serviced by the new Volunteer Artillery Corps. Brother! Oh, yes, oh, yes. Yes. And Napoleon never did invade, of course. He was finally defeated at Waterloo by the Duke of Wellington. And 30 years after that... The Duke of Wellington inspects New Haven Harbour. The battery is not well placed. It should be on the high ground. It should be armed with heavy ordnance. This harbour might become of great importance. The old Duke was right, as usual. The railway arrived. The harbour was improved. They started a steamer service to France and installed some more defences. The old battery now had six guns, and a new battery was built on the foreshore for six more guns. Here we go again. The French are building warships. Ironclad warships powered by steam. My navy is bigger than your navy. Sherbrooke is being fortified. Oh, yes, yes, yes. A pistol pointed at the heart of England. Here, here, here. Let us do something. <laughs> something must be done. Build defences, new forts, new guns. Build, build. Build, said Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister, and we built the most expensive programme of defences the country had ever seen, and I was to design and build the largest fortification ever constructed in Sussex, New Haven Fort. Yes, that's me. Lieutenant J.C. Ardar, Royal Engineers. It's 1862, I'm 22, and bursting with ideas. Normal procedure is to first flatten the land 
and then build a standard fort. But that is not how I intend to do it. My fort will take advantage of the contours of the land. And I will use the shingle on the beach to make concrete the material of the future. No one had ever used concrete in a military fortification in any quantity before. I was the first. A special lift was constructed, powered by steam, to haul the shingle 120 feet up the cliff. The concrete was used to support the sides of the ditches, and it's still there. We used lots of bricks too, of course, made here in New Haven. I used different colours to create pleasing patterns. A bit of an artist, you know, as well as an engineer. That's my drawbridge, Ardal's Equilibrium Bridge, raised and lowered by counterweight and completely covering the entrance when raised. Excellent. I became quite famous in military engineering circles. We used 250 laborers, 20 horses, and three steam engines to build the fort. The basic construction was like this. First line of defense was the cliffs, of course. Boat filled with water at the bottom of an unclimbable hill. Ditches 50 feet deep. Protection on all four sides, you see. Earth from the ditches built up the ramparts. Defences for the fort. Counterscarp galleries built into the ditch walls from where you could fire your guns and rifles. To protect the beach, steps led down through the cliff to the Caponier. This fortification was surrounded by a moat. Rifles could be fired towards the sea or along the line of the cliff face. Now, the guns. Nine facing the sea, six covering the harbour, one gun and two mortars facing inland. Within the fort, the gunpowder was kept in the grand magazine. The powder was taken to the laboratory where the shells and cartridges were made. Passages around these buildings afforded access to the lighting windows. The candle lamps had to be separated from the dangerous gunpowder, you see. The shells were then stored in magazines close to the gun emplacements, ready for use. Around the parade ground were the arched casemates in which the soldiers lived. A master gunner, the officers' quarters, and the men. Seventy-two fortifications were built along the coast, costing some twelve million pounds. Sadly, they became known as Palmerston's Follies. You see, there never was an invasion from France, and within a few years the forts were out of date and the guns became increasingly useless against armoured ships, and the new high-explosive shells could knock holes in a brick-built fort. In 1904, they put in bars, an extremely good idea. And around that time, the old guns at New Haven Fort were replaced. The fort continued to be garrisoned and was used for training. Then, there was another emergency. Germany. The Great War. The Sussex Royal Garrison Artillery man the fort. The harbour became a major supply port, shipping six million tons of ammunition and stores to the British Army in Europe, and bringing some of the men home. But the advent of aeroplanes made the big forts along the coast even more obsolete. No protection from the sky. And by 1934, our coastal defences are completely out of date. The cost they are completely <laughs> Not good news at that particular time. Germans enter Poland. World War II. The big one.
dispose of dangerous material from military sites around the country. Eventually, memories of the war faded. Then, in 1962, the fort ceased to be a working military establishment, and it was handed over to the local authority. Houses and flats were built over the site of the first permanent gun battery, which had been installed 200 years before. A holiday village was planned. Everything which could be bulldozed was bulldozed. Beautiful concrete ditches were filled with silt from the new marina site. Then, the Holiday Village project was abandoned. Now, if you fill in the ditches, who can get into the fort? Anyone. And they did. Vandals, thieves, destroyed everything. But all was not lost. The fort was designated an ancient monument, and a local developer planned a leisure centre. 